So, um, there seems to have been a technology failure today, so I won't use that board because my camera doesn't work. Um, uh, too bad. Can you use so, it anyway? Huh? Use it anyway? Yeah. What, you want to go up and man the camera? Otherwise, people will complain that I go over here. See, now I'm off camera, I can do whatever I want to do. Um, so, I'll just use these two boards. Okay, so like to finish with, with paper series stuff so that we can move on to other things. Uh, so at the end of the last class, so one, one of the things, so I'm going to remind you, we have, a, we have a, a power series or a, so we have a Taylor and a Lauren series. So a Taylor series looks like Power series. Uh, power series like this, where we're not necessarily centered at zero. And the Glorin series is a special case of the Taylor series. Let me actually not write it as AN. Let me write it. Since it's a Taylor series and not a power series. So this is f prime of some number f to the nth derivative, some number n factorial x minus c to the n. And then the Glorin series is the same thing except c is 0, n derivative is 0, n factorial x to the n. So when we have an infinite series like this, um, as one of the main utilities of series, it's often difficult to add up infinitely many things, so we're going to stop somewhere. So the question is, which I wrote at the end of the last time, uh, so both of these define some function, and so this gives us f of x. Um, so the question is how good is the approximation if we stop after n terms? So that is, we, we, we write some number which is called the remainder, which is the difference between the actual summing up to infinity minus when we stop it in terms. Uh, let's write it this. And the difference here is we want something that's good for all the x's. I want to think of this as a function like a polynomial of degree n. This will be a polynomial of degree big N. And we want to know how far off will that polynomial be from the actual function. So we can't quite use just the integral test or um, you know, the, those two series those two remainder things that we had before, where we integrate the tail, or it's an alternating series, and we use the alternating series remainder. But it's very similar. And, and the theorem is that, so the answer is if we know that the nth derivative is no bigger than some number for all the x's that we care about, uh, the center, and I don't know, the center plus some number of e. I have too many letters here, sorry. Uh, then the remainder is less than or equal to basically the next term but where we replace 
the value of the derivative by this family. So it's no bigger than m over n factorial. Can you read this? All right, it's big mess. Okay, times uh, uh, these are n plus one. So I'm sorry. So it's just like. The alternating series test, except we have to plug in a value, and the place where we where we place the coefficient with is not necessarily the place where we're evaluating. I don't know if you quite followed that. So let me do an example. Right, so does this make sense to people, kind of? Not at all? Not at all. Okay, so let me do an example. Um, let me first start with one we know. So I want to use e to the x is about 1 plus x plus n squared over 2. And I'm just going to stop here at 2. Um, so how good is this? So what's the, what's the worst approximation? If I take, say, x between minus 0.1 and plus 0.1. In other words, how far off will this go? What's the biggest error I make? Right? The graph of e to the x looks like this. And this polynomial is a parabola. So how good is this parabola? How closely does this parabola fit if I go out to point one on either side? What's, what's this mistake? Okay. So we have to do a little bit of work. We have to see what the third derivative is at the center. So here my center is c equals zero. I'm going to Taylor series at zero. And I want to know what's the biggest error if I'm going to replace the calculation of e by calculation of this degree 2 polynomial. How far off will I be? And so this theorem tells me, well, I've got to figure out what's the biggest the third derivative is in this region. And then I'm OK. So I need the maximum of the third derivative of x for x in this range. That will give me my m. So here the third derivative, I probably shouldn't have used e, but that's okay. So f of x is e to the x. f prime, this is a stupid example, maybe I should have done a minus x. Can I use a minus x? It doesn't matter f prime of x is e to the x, f double prime of x, you know, we get the idea. f triple prime of x is e to the x. So what's the biggest e to the x is between point 0.1 and minus point 0.1? e to the point 0.1. Oops, e to the point 0.1. Okay? So that's some number, which unfortunately I don't know off the top of my head. If somebody has a calculator, maybe you could calculate it for me. And so now that tells me, which I guess I'll do over here, that my error, R, R3, is no more than uh, e to the 
point one over three factorial times uh, x cubed. As long as I stay within point one, my answer will be good to this much. Does anyone have a calculator? Tell me what e to the point one is. I mean, I can guess what. 1.105. So, <coughs> 1.105 and some more digits, right? Okay. So my error will be no more than this. And remember, x here is less than 0.1 in absolute value. So this is really 0.1 q. So this is, uh, so that's point, point 0.1 cubed will give me uh, point zero zero 0.001, which will move this back three places. Uh, so if I divide that by six, this is point zero 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 two. So this is good to within 0, 0.00, within better than three places if we replace e by 1 plus x plus x squared as long as we keep the value small. Then e is just like this thing with better than three places accuracy. Okay? Of course, yeah? Um, did you start that the second derivative? So if I had stopped at the second derivative, I would be estimating how close e is to 1 plus x. Right? I mean, I, since the, all the derivatives of e are e to the x, this was easy. But, so could I have stopped at the second derivative? Well, it wouldn't be estimating what I wanted. In this case, the m is the same for all of them because e to the x is its own derivative. What are you estimating? I'm trying to say the derivative is no bigger than some number. So let me do another example where the function changes when I take the derivative. Yeah? Okay. I'm saying I want to use this estimate for this range of x's. The biggest that the third derivative is is when it's point 0.1. But it's never point 0.1. But it's as close to point 0.1 as I want. So what could I use? 0.99999, 0.0999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
approximate, I don't know, the cube root near x equals 8. And let's, uh, let's uh, use four terms. Six and seven. Um, let's just okay. Six and ten, right? That's two on either side. Okay. So same question. In in some sense, just a different function. So here, I don't even know the series. So there's my function, x to the one third, and I want to know. I'm going to start, I'm just going to derive the Taylor series. And I want it near x equals 8, and I know the cube root of 8, that's 2. Sorry, that's an 8. Okay, so I need to calculate several derivatives of this. I'm doing n equals 4. So, this is 1 third x to the minus 2 thirds. I don't really, well, I will need this. F prime of 8 is 1 third uh, x to the 8 to the minus 2 thirds. So cube root of 8 is 2. 2 to the minus 2 is 4. I take the second derivative. This is minus 2 ninths x to the minus why can't I do this? Uh, 5 thirds, which is at 8, this is minus 2 ninths, 1 over 2 to the fifth is uh, 32, right? Why can't I do that? I don't know. Uh, which is for 32. Yeah. Maybe I should do n equals 3. I'm getting tired. Okay, so this is 10 27 x to the minus 8 thirds. This is minus, this is plus 10 27 1 over 2 to the 8th. Some number that I've forgotten. One more. The fourth derivative is minus 80 over uh, 81. Really? That doesn't seem right. Okay. X to the minus uh, 11 thirds. So the fourth derivative is minus 80 over 81, 1 over 2 to the 11. And then I will need this, as I said, n equals 4 for some stupid reason. Uh, 80 times 11 is 8, 8, 0. And 3 times 81 is 243 x to the minus 14 thirds, fifth derivative at 8 is some horrible number, 880 over 243 times 1 over 3 over 14. Okay, so what? So what's my series? Uh, I guess I'm going back over here. So my series is 
and just take all of those numbers, divide them by the powers n factorial, and multiply by x, to, x minus 8 to the n, right? So, cube root of x, I'm only taking the first four terms, so I'm stopping here, is 2 plus 1 12th, did I get the sign right? No, nobody told me that I got the sign wrong. All of these signs are backwards. No, they were all right. Okay. That's why nobody told me it was wrong, because it was right. Okay, so this is a plus, that's a minus, this is a plus, that's a minus, this is a plus. This is a plus, that's a minus, this is a plus. Okay, good. Sorry. X minus 2 minus the next term is, I have no idea what 9 times 32 is, 288. But I'm going to put over 2, so that's uh, 144. That doesn't seem right. 288, but then I have a 2 on top, so it's 144. So if my arithmetic is right, um, but then I, have, oh, then I have to double it again. Duh. So let me just leave it. 2 over 9 times 32 times 2 factorial x minus 2 squared, and then I ran out of room, plus, so n equals 4, so I have to do 2 more, uh, 10 over 27 times 2 to the 8, which is some number that I know but I don't know today, times 3 cubed, 3 factorial, yeah, some number I know, but I just don't know it today, uh, x minus 2 cubed, and one more term, uh, 80 over 81 times 2 to the 11, which is another number I know, but I don't know today, 4 factorial, x minus 4, that's a 4, why not? Okay, I'm getting screwed up. There we go. So this is my fourth degree polynomial approximation of the fourth group, which is way better than I need. So how good is this? Well, we have to look at, I guess I didn't need this. We have to look at what is the biggest this is over the region in question. This is an increasing function, right? No, it's a decreasing function. No, it's a root. It's increasing. Sorry. This is an increasing function, so it's biggest when x is 10. And will be smallest when x is 6. So the bound that I want, so this is good to within uh, that, that thing. 880 over 243, 10 to the minus 14 thirds, <coughs> divided by 5 factorial, and then when we evaluate it at 10, so that would be 10 minus 2 to the fifth. <clears throat> so this is some number you can punch in. Yeah? How did you know that it was good with the not range? Because of this theorem, which I've erased. Um, so the thing that I erased says, it's like the alternating series test, but it says the fifth derivative The thing, the term you didn't use, 
except we, we take the x that makes it the biggest. Why did you go to the fourth term? Because I went to the fourth term here. But that's what you're supposed to find. Like how good it was. Okay, so let's think about an alternating series. Maybe you remember this one. If I say I want to, to know how good, if I just take two terms of the alternating series, how good is that? How far off is that from the end? It's the value of the term you didn't use. This is the term I didn't use. So it's no worse than the term I didn't use. Yes? Well, this is biggest at x equals 10. So the most error happens at x equals 10. Ten minus, why is that an 8? This should be an 8. All of these are 8s. All these 2s are 8s. I have trouble telling 2 from 8, apparently. All of these 2s are 8s. So at 6, I get the same thing. 6 minus 8, 10 minus 8, absolute value. Oh, you're right. This should be a 6. Woo. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter. It's biggest at 6. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Right, 1 over, one over 6 to the 14 over 3 is bigger than 1 over 10 to the 14 over 3. Because it's one over. So if the bottom's bigger, this is smaller. So we do it at 6, not at 10. I'm sorry, it's a decreasing function. And so I'm sorry I screwed up. I always screw up. That's what I do. It's my job. So again, the way this works, it's actually very simple. I know it seems confusing. And I'm sorry I made so many mistakes today. Uh, is we calculate the Taylor series. So here the center is at 8, even though I kept writing 2. The center is at 8, so we calculate the Taylor series. We stop somewhere. And the error is given by the next term. But since the next term involves an x, so you can put an x here if you want. Since the next term involves an x, we have to say when it will be worse. And it's worse when this derivative is the biggest. Because we're looking at the error over a whole range. It's a function, and we're saying, how much is this function off from that function? And the difference will be controlled by the place where it's the worst. So we have to look wherever this quantity is biggest. And I screwed up and put a 10 where I should have put a 6. Usually it's at the middle or one of the two ends. So check the middle of the two ends. If you really want to be careful, like if you're doing an engineering project and you, your bridge will fall down if it's wrong, then you should take the next derivative, find out where it's zero, determine whether the function is increasing or decreasing, or has a maximum in the middle or whatever the hell it is, and use that. But usually it's at one end or the other, or maybe the middle. Okay? I want to move on. I'm tired of this stuff. I'm sure you are too. Are we okay with this? So, you, have, you will have some problems on this for your homework. Feel free to ask if you're more confused. Let's move on to our next topic. So, so I know, sorry, we wanted things to get easier, so now we need to be easier. Yay! Okay, so our next topic. What? We went over binomial series. We went over binomial series last time. Well, I can't spend a whole week on everything, or we'll, we'll spend a year doing this class. Binomial series is just another series. It's the same jump. 
If you have a vital and serious question, I'm happy to do it. Okay, Okay. Um, find the Maclaurin series for the function 1 over the square root of 4 minus x. I did one almost exactly like this in class. I did a 9 instead of a 4. Factor the 4 out. You have 1 over uh, a half, right? So I won't do it completely. But that series now, right? So this is one half, one minus x over four equal one half. Negative, it's negative, yeah. Whatever I'm saying. Now write the binomial series, make the substitution u equals x over four. So you have one half, one minus u to the minus one half. This is a binomial series. This, this is minus one half to choose n. Uh, 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 u to the n, but I, my u is x over four. Huh? Okay, so let me tell you how the choose thing works in a second. So. The choose thing, if this is not a whole number, or is not bigger than is not bigger than this, is just start taking subtracting. So this is, I guess I'll write it here. This is one half. So I just said I wasn't going to do it, now I just did it. Oh well. So the first term here is uh, zero. The next term, so I get x, I get one. And then the next term here is one half over one x over four. Then the next term is it? A, oh, it's a minus one half. Sorry. Then the next term is minus a half minus one more over two, and so on. So you just keep subtracting one each time as you kick up the factorial at the bottom. Okay? This is not what I'm doing. So, so this is how these work. Are you okay with this? You just manipulate it into another series and there it is. Okay. Uh, okay, so I want to move on to a different topic. So once again, so I think this is Appendix H. I don't know. I. So we're going to talk about complex numbers for a little bit. Twenty minutes, and then I'll do a little more on Monday. So, how many of you used complex numbers a little bit in high school education? How many people have never used complex numbers? I think you're lying. Okay, so you may remember that sometimes, like when you're solving a quadratic equation or something. You have something like the square root of negative 8. It shows up in there. So we can factor the 8 out. Oh, that was bad. It's all right. How about the square root of negative 81? We can factor the 81 out and get 9, but we can't do anything with this square root of 1, so we just call it a new number, which we call i. When they first started doing this in approximately 16-something, I think, maybe even the 16th century, so maybe 15-something, this seemed so unusual to them that they called these imaginary numbers. They're not really imagined well, they're just an extension of numbers, but they turn out to be very useful even in doing things 
where the solutions don't involve imaginary numbers or complex numbers, which we'll say in a second. So we just, for argument's sake for now, we define a new number whose square root is the, who is the square root of negative 1. So that means that if we square this number, we get negative 1. And we can extend the ordinary real numbers that we've dealt with by adding these things on. So a complex number is just an ordinary real number. It's a pair of things. So, an ordinary real number plus some multiple of one of those things. And they turn out to be useful. We will hopefully get to some of the useful applications of it soon, but they will also come up later in the course, and they certainly come up in all sorts of applications. So, if we have a number of the form A plus BI, so this is a real number. and that's a real number. This is called the real chart of the complex number, A. And B is called the imaginary part. And usually, when we have variables, which we will get to very soon, usually for real numbers we use the letter X or y to represent a real variable, and typically people use z for complex numbers. It's no hard and fast rule you could use any letter, you could use x, but often when you see f of z, they're trying to tell you this is a complex function. Okay. So, oh, you need that. So we can do arithmetic with these things, and they work just like binomials. So polynomials with two things. So if we add two of them together, so if we have 3 plus 2i plus 5 minus 7i, we just add the real parts, add the imaginary parts. No surprise there. If we multiply these two things together, <coughs> we multiply them like polynomials of degree 2. So we FOIL it out. 3 times 5 is 15. 3 times minus 7 is minus 21i. 2i times 5 is 10i and 2i times minus 7i is minus 14i squared, but that's actually a plus 14. Because i squared is minus 1. So this collapses to 15 plus 14 minus, no, plus, minus 21 plus 10i, so that's 29 minus 11i. So this is all really exciting. Um, we can divide them too. If you divide, then you just rationalize the denominator to get the i's on the top. So if I wanted to do, I don't know, 1 over 1 plus i, say. Or how about, let's do 1 minus i over 1 plus i. If I want to do this division, then I do the trick where I want to turn this into something not involving an i, so I multiply by its conjugate, top and bottom. This is not 29. So on the bottom, 
1 plus i times 1 minus i is 1 times 1. The middle terms drop out. i times minus i is equal to bsd. And on the top, I have 1 plus i quantity squared, which gives me, um, so 1 plus minus 1 is a 0. What? Something wrong there. You just do it out. Okay, so 1 times 1 is 1, and then the middle term I get minus i minus i, and then this term gives me plus i squared. Yeah, that's right. So this gives me minus 2i over 2, which is minus i. Plus i squared. Okay. So that's all well and good and not terribly exciting. I want to actually interpret these in a slightly different way. Oh, by the way, I neglected to say this. When we have a complex number, I guess here. So if I have a complex number, z equals a plus i b, its complex conjugate, z bar, is a minus i b. So this is called the conjugate. Okay, I want to interpret this stuff geometrically. These complex numbers, a plus ib, well, I have, they have two parts. So just like for real numbers, I can find it on the number line. So if I want to put, say, the real number pi, that will be right here on the number line. I can have a number plane for complex numbers. They won't fit on the line because they have two parts. 1 plus i, where would I put 1 plus i on the line? It doesn't go on the line. So I can think of this as the complex plane. So in the complex plane, we put the real numbers along the x-axis, and I put the imaginary numbers vertically along the y-axis. And if I have a point like 1 plus 2i, I would plot it at coordinates 1, 2. <laughs> Now this seems, oops, this seems stupid, but actually there's some nice geometric intuition that goes with this. Um, so I can interpret this as a vector. And this addition process, when I add two complex numbers like a plus ib plus C plus I B. This gives me A plus C plus I times B plus D, which corresponds exactly to, so instead of 1 plus 2i, let's put A plus I B here, and let's put C plus I B here, corresponds exactly to addition of vectors like that. So, if you've dealt with vectors in physics or in other contexts, addition of complex numbers is exactly the same as addition of vectors in the plane. Subtraction of complex numbers works exactly like subtraction of vectors. So, Oh, there's two other words I forgot to say.
So adding and subtracting two numbers, you can interpret this operation geometrically as addition and subtraction of vectors. Now vectors have another property. How many of you have dealt with vectors before? Okay, mostly everybody. Vectors have another way of thinking of them. They have a magnitude and they have a direction. So to these complex numbers, we can assign a magnitude and a direction. So, so complex numbers also have magnitude and direction because we have this association between them angle theta, so which is called the argument of z. Is the angle if you were to think of z or a plus i b in polar coordinates. calculate the argument and the norm for arbitrary complex numbers in the same way that if you just convert the number to polar coordinates, you get the same thing. Okay? How many people have seen this before? Fewer, but some. Okay. So we can think of these complex numbers polar coordinates or in rectangular coordinates, and in fact, we can switch back and forth. Um, now, when we add complex numbers, this is addition of vectors, there's no such thing as multiplication of vectors. It doesn't really make sense in terms of vectors, but it does make sense in terms of complex numbers. So let's think about what this multiplication of vectors we do. So let's just write it out. So if I want to multiply, well, When I'm multiplying a plus ib plus c plus ib, then I multiply together the two real part of uh, the two real parts, and I will subtract off the product of the imaginary parts. 
That's the real part. And then the, the resulting imaginary part is just the product of the two imaginaries. BC plus AD. So this is the same formula that I had written down, well, I did by example over there. But suppose we think of this in polar coordinates. So I'm going to write A plus IB and C plus ID in polar coordinates instead, which uh, let's draw it here. So this is R times the cosine of theta, and this is R times the sine of theta. So this is the same A plus IB, but I'm just writing it in terms of polar coordinates. Oh, so here I have R cosine of theta plus I sine theta, and that's A plus IB. And C plus ID is some other, so this will be, say, S cosine of phi, B is S sine of phi. So phi is some other angle, because I'm multiplying two different numbers with different angles and different arguments together. And so when I multiply them together, well, I guess it's already written there. So then the product is this times this. So this is R, S, cosine theta, cosine phi. So that's this part here, minus, well, BD is R S sine theta sine theta. Maybe this looks familiar to you, maybe not, maybe you don't remember your trick very well. And then this part, BC AD, almost no time. So BC is uh, R S sine theta sine. What did I do wrong here? A C. Yeah, this goes. And then the other one, sine P. Cosine theta. So what is this? This is R S cosine of theta plus B. R S sine of theta plus B. In other words, multiplying in complex numbers means multiply the widths and add the angles. So when I multiply these two complex vectors together, I want to multiply this complex number times this complex number. What I do is I just take their links and multiply them together. And I add this angle to this angle. So Thank you. 